Hi, I'm Joseph Newgarden, and you're listening to F1 Weekly. There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you're not one of them. Welcome to f one My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 1030, February 5th, 2024, Nasser. Thank you, sir. I say ciao, Toto. Hello, Enzo. Just say no from FOM. Zach Brown starts his engine. Peroni back at Ferrari. We do double the pleasure at Daytona. We shall explain very gladly. And Mr. Rogers, as you know, just before we walked into the palatial studios, this news broke out about Christian Horner, which we will discuss later, not so gladly. Back to you, Chief. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, Lewis Hamilton's move to Ferrari is monumental. And exactly what the good racing doctor ordered. Very happy about this. Why do they continue to break Mario's heart? Williams unveiled their 2024 Challenger, the FW46. Nice livery. Looks clean. Everybody's hoping for the best. Sauber, they unveil their bright green, I should say money green and black C44. Looks absolutely wonderful. And of course, Fernando says, the new poster boy for Bad Karma is Nick DeFries. And this week's interviews, ladies and gentlemen, the winners of the 2024 Daytona 24 Hours, the drivers of Porsche Penske, Felipe Nasser, and Joseph Newgarden, ladies and gentlemen. Nasser will have all the chutzpah on that. And on top of that, we've got another episode of Loosh on the Loose gives us his thoughts on the Lewis to Ferrari news. So stay tuned for that. And just a reminder, yes, we do need your contributions. Keep this program up on the servers. Just click on the support F1 Weekly tab. You know, you want to NAS big news all over the place. This Lewis Hamilton thing jolted. The Andreas Fault Line in California. What say you, my friend? Yes, sir. Let's start with Red Skies at Brackley. Wow. Lewis leaving Mercedes to mount a prancing horse. The only way to explain this is to borrow a phrase from Mr. Murray. It's incredible. Mr. Rogers, my first reaction to the news, which, you know, I saw like five in the morning, was here we go again because every year there is a Lewis to Ferrari story. Oh, he just bought a Ferrari. He must be going there. Lewis had dinner with John Elkan. He must be moving to Maranello. These people need to know Lewis is not going to have dinner with Nasser Hamid and Clark Rogers in San Ho. I mean, John Elkan is the minimum requirement. And with all the lovey-dovey between LCH and Toto, Lewis proudly claiming, all my wins have been powered by Mercedes. Very true. They have been with me since karting days. Very true. LCH last Wednesday had breakfast with Toto at his Oxford office. I did not know he had an office in the university town also. I thought he was based in Brackley or Brooklands because Mercedes has very impressive facilities in both places. Toto knew right away because he's a smart cat that something was up when Lewis ordered scrambled eggs and instead of asking for English muffin, he asked for ciabatta bread. And that will give the, you know, cat will come out of the bag soon. So he then delivered one of the hardest decisions of my life as he put it. Now, I was still skeptical about the first two news items I read 
But when I read that Toto has called an all-staff meeting at Mercedes uh, headquarters through Zoom because he was not in the area, I just knew that this is happening. I think it's hard to feel too bad and sad when the prancing horse is paying you over a million dollars per week. Long story short is, if you don't give a great driver a great package, he cannot deliver. A 42-page, maybe it's 43, I don't know, page book has been written on this subject, but it's available only on Amazon.es. ES as in España. Gracias, muchachas. Now, there is a man at Ferrari by the name of Frederick Wesser, and I know from a source very close to him from years ago that he has a very, very high opinion of Lewis. It was in his GP2 team, ART Grand Prix, which he used to go on with Nicola Toss, that Lewis claimed championship success in his rookie season in that series in 2006. The following season, Ron put him in Formula 1 and LCH, as a rookie, roasted the Spanish rooster. <coughs> now, Ferrari has played chicken with their drivers too, like looking for tires on the drivers in the pit box or telling Leclerc to stay out when he's halfway through the pit lane. But when a driver of Lewis's caliber arrives, the bar is raised. As they say, a rising tide lifts all boats. I'm not calling Ferrari a sinking ship, but they are more like Bismarco past few seasons. In Lewis and Leclerc, they will have the best of experience and success, plus the promise of a young whippersnapper. Your machismo Fernando Alonso proved in the 2023 season that old dogs still have the bark and bite if they are thrown the right bone. Sir, were you surprised when you first saw the news, honestly? Absolutely. I mean, I got the news from you, Nasser. A text at 6 in the morning. It, it was exciting, shocking, but elevating. And, and and this is what I've been wanting. I always wanted to see LCH drive a different damn motor. And it's finally going to happen. And, I mean, there's going to be comical moments. But don't forget, this is still in 2025. What I find even more intriguing, it's very similar to when Fernando joined McLaren in a sneaky way, but still had to drive for another full season with Renault and, of course, getting his second championship in that last season with Renault. It would be interesting if LCH could do the same thing, win a championship, and then go to Ferrari, really to show his big guns and kahunas. Yes, well, that was my thought that Fernando Alonso announced a year before, before the current season started. Juan Pablo Montoya did the same thing. But, you know, let's be realistic. This Mercedes is not going to win the championship, and that's probably part of the reason he's bailing out. And of course, Mercedes will soon put a now hiding sign up in Brackley. Even though the job requirement will say words like team player, race and championship winning experience, no chaos or excess baggage, and very important team to provide physio. This is very important. I would still love to see Machismo at Mercedes. And Mr. Rogers, if he can get number three before LCH gets number eight, that will be his redemption song. All of us will be jamming. What is your tune on this Rock the Boat news that Alonso might go there? Well, I think that's extremely far-fetched. He's got a contract with Aston Martin. Now, the contract with Honda and Aston Martin could play into this, but it's also intriguing. And really, my thoughts for the driver that should replace Lewis Hamilton, for me, it's really simple. He's German, he's put in his time, he's dependable, reliable, and a really nice guy, and that would be Nico Hulkenberg. God damn it, let's give Nico Hulkenberg a good package so we could see what he can do finally, because I think we've been shortchanged and Nico's been shortchanged. That's a good idea, sir. Now, let's take a look at Lewis's background with the star of Stuttgart. Lewis's love affair with Mercedes started with courtship from Nicky Lauda. Then in the kitchen of his mom's house, 
Lewis made up his mind after Ross Brown promised him a rose garden, along with some sunshine and lots of Deutsche Marks and dollars. Here we are today, six championships in seven years, 82 Grand Prix wins, 78 pole positions with Mercedes. Oh, what a feeling. Sorry, Toyota. The man, after a silence of a day, has spoken, and Lewis said this, and I will quote him now. I have had an amazing 11 years with this team, and I'm so proud of what we have achieved together. Mercedes has been part of my life since I was 13 years old. It's a place where I have grown up, so making the decision to leave was one of the hardest decisions I have ever had to make. Mr. Rogers, do you see the tears flowing down the Thames? <laughs> no, it's the right decision. For me, it's the obvious decision for everybody because... It avoids the awkwardness when a driver gets old and it's time to retire. I hated what happened to Schumacher. And this way, that's all gone. Toto can wash his hands. He doesn't have to have that awkward moment. So it's, I think it's a very, very good deal for everybody. And finally, Lewis will get his free Ferraris. He'll become hipper and cooler. Now, of course, Marinello and Montezemolo has already had the talk with them. Once you go to Marinello, it is not a Compton. You have to behave accordingly. But besides that, it's going to be awesome. Yes. Well, if you want to, if he wants to get a flavor of Compton, he can drive down to Napoli. But that's another story. Okay, Lewis continued, and I quote him. But the time is right for me to take this step, and I'm excited to be taking on a new challenge. I will be forever grateful for the incredible support of my Mercedes family, especially Toto for his friendship and leadership, and I want to finish on a high together. I am 100% committed to delivering the best performance I can this season and making my last year with the Silver Arrows one to remember. End quote. Do you remember how Ayrton Senna finished his association with McLaren? The final race was in Australia, and who was the winner? Oh, man. I got to tell you this, I was watching a program on the history of, uh, I, I may have mentioned this in a previous podcast, I think 60, 60 years of McLaren and Ron Dennis. Yes, I think I mentioned, you have to listen what, um, what's his name, Joe Ramirez had to say, even though he was a Alain Prost man, which he stated in his book himself. He said at the Australian Grand Prix 1993 season finale, he sa- and he broke down. Okay, in tears with Senna's sister and uh, niece there. He said shortly before the start, he said to Senna, you know, McLaren is tied with uh, Ferrari. I think the number was 103 Grand Prix wins. And he said, cryingly, that if you win this race, I will love you forever. And he did. But that was Ayrton Senna and we wish Lewis all the best too. Okay, sir. One of the reasons, I'm sure there's more than one reason why he's leaving. You know, he's not short on money, so maybe money played a part. But one of the reasons for his uh, departure, maybe the no he got from the Daimler board on its requirement to be granted an ambassador role for him after his racing days were over, kind of like Sterling Moss, who was a Mercedes ambassador till the day he passed away. Plus, if you recall, last year Lewis complained more than once that the team did not go with his suggestion in the design of the car. One win for the team with the other driver on top of that, George Russell, is not very inspiring for the only driver in Formula 1 history who has century of wins. One final financial note on the Mercedes to Ferrari deal. Lot of hoopla that Ferrari stock valuation jumped billions and billions of dollars I think there is a lot of irrational exuberance over this. Timing was such. Same day Ferrari announced their quarterly earnings and they were higher than analyst estimates. With all due respect to LCH's 103 Grand Prix wins, hard to believe institutional investors and buffets of the world will buy a stock based on signing of a driver who has not won a race in two years. And that is just my two rupees. But Mr. Rogers, you have a few billions and billions invested in the Istanbul stock market. Did you buy a block of shares in RACE, which is Ferrari stock symbol on the big board, which is New York Stock Exchange? 
Yes, of course. Everybody logged in and, and hit buy, buy, buy. Except that I use pesos. So it's much more affordable that way, Nasser. But no, I'm only excited for Formula One. The problem is now we got to wait a year. So we'll see what happens. But it's going to be exciting. Who replaces Lewis Hamilton? That's going to be the talk of the town. Does he go young or does he go old? That is the question. Well, the question is, you may ask yourself, who is the replacement, which you already did? And I say same as it ever was. I very much hope Toto can hear the drums from the Fernando camp. I think this is last chance saloon for Machismo to get into a potentially competitive machinery that he has deserved for so long. The publicity for Mercedes and Formula One will be mega. We all know Machismo brings extent to the team, though I am not sure if Toto and the board at Daimler-Benz, which is not comprised of beach boys and physios from Ibiza, will be interested in the 60 pounds of excess baggage he will bring. I think, you tell me if you agree with me, if there was a poll among F1 fans, and F1 is very high on you know gathering information from fans, if there was a poll, I'm convinced Alonso will be clear favorite to take that seat. And taking Lewis's seat at Mercedes will be his guilty pleasure. What say you? It would be an unbelievable story, which eventually would be told by Brad Pitt, I assume. But no, I mean, we're talking Hollywood now. Fictional characters in an un unbelievable complex competition world. Yeah, I mean, these are dreams, Nasser. But it would be exciting. I mean... Deep down, Toto, you you think, might even want to see this. So it could happen, but I really don't think so. They're going to go be very safe. But I still think Nico Hulkenberg really is the one that deserves it the most. Have you become his agent in the last 24 hours? Yes, uh, we're, we've invested in him, and uh, he'll be wearing a F1 Weekly hat from now on. Good. Now, among the possibilities, and a lot of people have mentioned these names that I'm going to bring, which are pretty obvious. Esteban Ocon, he is currently at Alpine, but I think still under contract to, you know, Mercedes Junior program. He is a Grand Prix winner and Formula 3 champion. Now, this championship came against strong opposition, which included a single-seater rookie by the name of Max Verstappen. Esteban Ocon and George Russell in the same team will require sponsorship and free supply for Toto from Tylenol. I have a feeling this combo will not work, especially seeing how Esteban and Checo went for each other's throat at Force India, Racing Point, whatever they were called. Do you agree, sir? I do agree. I think it would be chaotic. I don't see the chemistry that's needed between Ocon and Russell. Because Russell, of course, now he is having world championship fantasies since Lewis is leaving. So a lot of young people are having fantasies. We'll see what it comes down to. That's why I'm thinking, let's quelch those fantasies and put in an older driver who deserves the seat, be it Fernando or Nico Hulkenberg. Now, another possibility which has been shot down by James Wiles today is Alexander Elbon. He was very competitive against Max and Leclerc in their karting days. But F1 is, a, is all about what have you done for me lately. Against Max at Red Bull, Elbon melted faster than Hagen does in the dry heat of Arizona. He is looking good against Logan Sargent. In the right car and environment, I think he can run with George Russell at Mercedes. For Elbon, because there were some reports that he'll get a three-year contract at Red Bull, for round two will be case of be careful what you wish for just might come true. That wish was granted not too long ago and we all know how it ended. Mercedes will be a much better option if available. I think he and George will provide Toto with peace and harmony. Now we come to Carlos Sainz Jr. This will be a simple trade-off. He is a two-time Grand Prix winner. Dr. Marco recently said he was quite a match for Max at Toro Rosso. Carlito comes across most of the time as a good team player, even though he has been known to say no to a team. But in saying no to Ferrari normally turns out to be the right decision. He reminds me of nice guys of Grand Prix racing like Bottas and Fisico, fast, 
but lacking the killer instinct of sharks and barracudas, which we have seen in the waters of Formula One with all great champions. Oh, now we come to Mick Schumacher, Formula One reserve driver for Mercedes. He may be a sentimental favorite, but based on performance in two seasons in Formula One, hard to believe he will be back in Formula One with a top team, especially replacing a seven-time world champion. Toto likes him, though. He may think Mick may do what dear Papa could not do at Mercedes. Mick recently signed a contract to race for Alpine in WEC, but so did Lewis for Mercedes. Formula One has already become pay-to-play. Let's hope it does not become a sentimental journey also. Now, the name of Sebastian Vettel you mentioned and has also been suggested. With all due respect to his four-in-a-row championship, Today, I think his priorities are different and it will be better if Toto leaves him, leaves him to his bees and apple trees campaign. Mr. Rogers, would you like to see Seb back in an F1 seat or will that be too much flegel flugel with Toto? I don't mind the flegel or the flugel, but no, like you said, he's moved on. And that's what's so good about Sebastian Vettel. He's solid, makes good decisions, even in, in times of tough decision making. Now, I could see him coming back maybe one day as an advisor or maybe a team principal as he gets older and has more wisdom. But in the end, Sebastian Vettel is definitely, definitely gone. You know, he will be, since he's very Germanic with systems and procedures and discipline and very good work ethics, I think he'll be a good team principal at an outfit like Haas F1. There must be order, Mr. Haas. But Mr. Rogers, I'm glad PC Train does not have a platform at the Brackley train station. Otherwise, the diversity and inclusion crowd will be jumping jacks to get Jamie Chadwick in Formula One. And, you know, we want top line drivers, not based on this and that. Okay, there's more. Toto has a lot of choices. Question is, is Kimi the next Max? We are talking about the Italian Kimi, Andrea Antonelli. He has been a Mercedes junior since his karting days and we've been singing his praises because of his performance from his karting days. Very impressive in single seaters, winning each championship he has competed in so far. Das plan was to put him in Formula 3 this season, but Mercedes has expedited his career pace and he will race in Formula 2 this season. As teammate to Oli Behrman, who could be the next big thing from jolly old England. If Italian Kimi does the job and win Formula 2 in his first year against Ferrari junior Behrman, who will be in his second year, I can see Kimi as teammate to George Russell in 2025. But I will be very pleasantly shocked and pleasantly surprised if Kimi Antonelli can win in his first year. But the one thing going for him, they have a brand new car. I don't know if you've seen this car. It's a nice looking car, so it's new for everyone. And let's see what happens. Now we come to very old reliable hands that Toto Wolf may reach out to, Valtteri Bottas. This would be a case of being there, done there. Race winning and obedient pedigree, Bottas was managed and funded by Toto from his junior days to arrival as Lewis's Rubinho. Would you like to see Valtteri Bottas there, sir? Well, you know, I think we've seen too much of Valtteri's Bottas's buttocks. So, I don't know. I think that's out of the bag now and he's got to he'll be thinking about other things pretty soon. And I think he wants to go to Audi. So, Botas is definitely out. I'm back with Fernando. Yes, sir. And sir, moving on, do you remember once upon a time in the West, Eric and Lyle Menendez were in the news in America, every program, everything, and then all of a sudden OJ happened and they disappeared from the scene. And same thing happened when FOM went on the Nancy Reagan program and said no, just say no, to Michael Andretti's entry. That news came, and the very next day, some people are saying this was pre-planned. The Lewis Hamilton departure news came, and nobody's talking about this. But no surprise here, the greed mongers of Formula 1 have said no to Michael Andretti's team in Formula 1. Amazing they have this power and privilege despite a thorough evaluation and approval by the FIA. Absolutely pathetic. The people who are most vocal against Michael represent multi-billion dollar businesses and they are worried about a smaller size of the hundreds of millions they receive as prize money. 
A name representing success on and off the track, a premium brand name belonging to one of the largest corporations on earth, is not good enough for their greed. Shame, shame, shame. And that's just a personal opinion, okay? It has now come to light that Michael did not respond to an email from FOM last December inviting him for a face-to-face meeting. Michael has been communicating with Stefano Domenicali and this email was sent by someone else. The geek squad at Andretti Global located this email in his spam folder. So the moral of the story, keep an eye on the spam folder, folks. There may be gold and silver in spam. I strongly believe FOM mind was made up on the outcome. Even if Michael had read the email and hopped on an F-16 fighting Falcon to meet FOM's talking heads, it would still have been the same old song, Stop Making Sense. If Michael Andretti had wired $200 million on Monday to each of the 10 teams, FOM will be singing like Lady Gaga, Ra Ra Rama Ra, I want anything and everything. In the final analysis, and again, this is just personal opinion, this is ABS, absolute bullshit. I better stop now, as I have a lump in my throat like you know who. What say you, amigo? Very, very sad. Not only that, but Mario not being a young man anymore. I thought it was cruel. The biggest thing is, what have the Andrenis, I mean, they've given to Formula One. You can't. Mario, Michael, I I just don't understand this weird, and, and a lot of it is Dominicali himself, so it's wrong, it's disgusting. I guess they saved their ass by saying, well, 2028, you'll be cool, because it is General Motors, the biggest corporation in the world, practically, at least it used to be. So it's quite shocking, very, very shocking. The problem is I think Andretti coming in would be just as good as Lewis going to Ferrari. It's just as exciting for Formula One. You know what really pisses me off? Mario Andretti was out of Formula One. And because of the tragedy to Villeneuve and Peroni, Enzo invited him to race at Monza, which was my first race. And I love saying that every time. And Mario comes in. And against Nelson Piquet, Keke Rosberg, the Renaults of Prost and Arnoux, he puts that car on pole position and was third in the race. Such an incredible legacy he has. And his son has done very well in racing and uh, business. Yes, the Formula 1 experiment did not work out. And they're giving these lousy nonsense excuses like, oh, they're not going to have a competitive package. Oh, my goodness. The most experienced team that has been there since the second race of the Formula One season of 1950. Gee, Mr. Signor Domenicali, when was the last time they won a driver's championship? We're talking 2007. Okay, second most successful team, I think, is McLaren right now in terms of wins. When was the last time they won a world championship? I believe with Lewis Hamilton in 2008, I guess, right? And the third most successful team in the history of Formula One is Williams. When was the last time they won a Formula One race? Do we have to go down to Venezuela to find that out? I'll visit Milka. Yeah, there you go. This is really, really pathetic. Basically, what you know, I might as well just appreciate them when they say, hey, you know what? Now they're trying to raise the $200 million, what was it called, anti-dilution fee to like $700 million. And, you know, another thing is uh, Liberty FOM is basically owned by Liberty Media, a U.S. company based in uh, New York. Stefano Domenicali is a paisan, and Mario Andretti is his fellow paisan for all practical purposes. And they just could not see some common ground. It's very, very bad. This is, I mean, I'm not going to use any vulgar language because this is a family show. But, you know, this is very, very sad, man. Very, very disappointed. But what can you do? No, it's very sad, and hopefully things will turn around. Yeah, hopefully things will turn around. Okay, sir, now we, apropos to the talk, we go to win the battle, lose the war. Nick de Vries, his French is fried after losing a legal battle against one of his backers. Nick, once a McLaren junior and managed by Anthony Hamilton, Papito of LCH, took a loan for $250,000 to take part in Formula 2 championship. Terms of the loan, not sure if they were in plain simple English or Dutch, but were pretty clear. 
Loan is forgiven if the driver does not make it to Formula 1 by 2022. Okay? Otherwise, lender will receive 50% of his earnings. As things turned out, appendicitis on Elbon allowed Nick to do his Dutch voodoo at Monza in 2022, which put him in the seat at Alfa Tauri for 2023. Now, Jacoby is for the defense, saying this is a tress driver scenario, so he doesn't have to pay 50% of his earnings. Myers, who is working for the lender, got a favorable decision as the court ruled this race as a race driver activity triggering the 50% income sharing clause, which also, of course, means returning the principal. I say always a good idea to read the fine print and amendments, if any. Just ask Eddie Jordan. Would you have any thoughts on this situation, sir? I feel terrible for DeVries, and not only that, but Toto, who was sort of handling his side, when he did go to Williams for that drive at Monza, I think somebody should have known that this might trigger something if he did well and got a seat in F1. And I think Toto should say, you know what, I'm going to kick down and pay these small fees. Because for Toto, this is peanuts. Okay, sir, on that peanuts, we need a break for Perrier. Deep below the plains of southern France, in a mysterious process begun millions of years ago, nature herself adds life to the icy waters of a single spring, Perrier. Its natural sparkle is more delicate than any made by man, and therefore more quenching, more refreshing, and the mixer par excellence, naturally sparkling from the center of the earth, Perrier. And here's Loosh on the Loose. Hello, F1 Weekly. This is Lucian Byfield in South Australia with Loosh on the Loose for February 2024. Well, here's to 2025 when Fernando Alonso wins his third title in a Mercedes and Lewis Hamilton in a Ferrari doesn't even get a podium. <laughs> hi, Clark. Hi, NASA. Well, you asked me to do my take on 2025 and all the Lewis hoopla, so here we go. So Mr. Hamilton is off to Ferrari. Well, I for one never thought it would happen. In all seriousness, even though I am not a Lewis fan at all, I do not understand the move. Now, I am happy for a seismic shift in the sport, which can only be a good thing overall, but it's going to be even better because I'm pretty sure that at least one of two things will happen. One, Lewis will be completely outdriven by Leclerc if Charlie Boy is allowed to be equal, which he will not be. Secondly, Ferrari will continue to not get their act together and it will be a career-ending move for Lewis, much like Ivan Capelli found out in 1992. Looking back through history, sometimes new blood revitalizes a team and maybe, just maybe, the whole Ferrari organisation will be remotivated and find some kind of cohesive flow, much like McLaren did after a winless season in 2006, when, in 2007, Lewis and Nando, the all-new lineup, completely inspired the whole team. Now, if not for poor team leadership allowing infighting and the Spygate scandal, McLaren would have cleaned up that year. Let's look at 2010. Ferrari were coming off of a relatively poor year in 2009 and boom, with Nando on board, they won first time out and they nearly won the title too. You can see a similar pattern when Vettel went to Ferrari in 15 and he won second time out again after the Ferrari team had had a poor 14 season. Hmm, it didn't result in a title campaign, but the fresh blood phenomenon was in play that year. Look back to 86, PK moves to Williams, boom, won first time out. Mansell to Ferrari in 89, boom, one first time out. Prost to Ferrari in 90, one second time out. And of course, Schumacher to Ferrari took a bit longer, but from poor form for years, from the Scuderia, at least with the new combo of Schumacher and Irvine in 96, there were wins, podiums and momentum, which led to a serious dominance era that nearly killed the sport. Hmm, so back to Hammy boy. Well... He will be in his 40s when he dons the red overalls. Not that age seems to stop Fernando, who must be 60 by now. Hmm. But no matter who you are, going up against the highly rated fastest man over a lap, Charles Leclerc, Hamilton will need more than talent to win there. 
he will need what he has had in the past. Team support, a teammate on a leash, uh, a.k.a. wingman, and a boss washing his tackle publicly. And yet, that would still not be enough if the performance is typical of the team. I love Ferrari, but I cannot forgive them for how they treated Prost, or for hiring Schumacher, and now for signing Hamilton. I guess I'm going to have to sell my Ferrari road car collection and start buying Aston Martins or something. So, where do all the other key players go? Well, I do not for one moment think that Alonso will end up at Mercedes. He won't get along with Toto. He'll be doing the GP2 engine scream, and there are far too many other possibilities. Unless they need a star name. Much in the same way McLaren did in 95 when they signed Mansell. Although Ron didn't want to, claiming he did not understand Nigel Mansell. Oh, then again, he signed Alonso again in 2015. Hmm. If Mercedes needs star power, Alonso will get the seat. Sponsors like to have winners, champions and personalities representing their products. So it is not impossible. Signs will end up at Audi. Alonso will stay at Aston, I think, for another year. And if Ocon is not snapped back up by Toto, which he won't be, uh, he owns him though, uh, well, there is Antonelli. And for me, I would take the risk on a young hot shoe before someone else does. As for Albon, well, I, I literally heard just this morning that he's staying at Williams. And then there is Mick Schu- uh, Crashmacker. Um, no, surely not. All right, wrapping this up, it has only been a few days and I am already tired of the story regarding Hamilton and Ferrari. All year, every year, we are bombarded daily about him. If he farts, if he coughs, you name it. One way or another, that guy knows how to stay in the spotlight. And as his light fades, somehow he has pulled off one of the biggest stories in the history of the sport. So credit where it is due. But in all honesty, the lustful British biased media who seem to only think Hamilton exists, are all wetting their pants, talking of wins and titles, but I think it is highly unlikely. So can we please remember, we have not even started 2024 yet, for goodness sake, and somehow these perpetual victim vibes for Hamilton have got to stop because he is the most lucky, the most celebrated, and has the greatest stats of anyone in the history of the sport. (sighs) But if you listen to the largely British-based media, They seem to think that the only hope of beating Max is to get Lewis in a top car, and they look to him as the only possible roadblock to more Red Bull dominance. But there are other drivers and other teams on the grid. Uh, There are. Just have a look. And they're getting better too. Oh, and there's other top talents waiting in the wings. (sighs) So can we get rid of the... Oh, poor Lewis, a couple of winless years. Oh, he needs a chance. Oh, he's our only hope. Can we get rid of that? Oh, if you want to talk about bad luck, just look no further than Fernando Alonso. There you go. <laughs> My take on 2025 is, can we start 24? Thanks a lot, guys. This is Lucian Byfield with Lucia on the Loose. Thank you, Lucia. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host. In now, as we spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial and the king, the sultan himself, Nasser Hamid. Thank you, sir. And I say, Mr. Zach Brown, start your engine. Well, they have already done that. The McLaren team has fired their engine on the new car. But Mr. Rogers, since the hybrid Hoover sound is not exciting, as exciting as Honda V10 and Ferrari V12, we will spare the grief of sharing the audio audio sound bite. Have you watched that video or listened to this? No, sir. As just like you, I only listen to Renault V10s or Matra V12s. Yeah, you know, speaking of which, when you go on YouTube and watch, I was watching the 1993 Portuguese Grand Prix, uh, Mika's first race with McLaren, where he out-qualified Senna, and that sound of those engines, man, it's so sad to see what we have now. But that's the way it is. It is now. Peroni back at Ferrari, the beer brand that is. They have signed a five-year agreement uh, with Peroni's 0.0% non-alcoholic version of the beer, and they will produce limited edition of Tifosi branded bottles. And Peroni is part of Asahi Holdings of Japan. Uh, would you like to see uh, Rich Energy back in action? No, sir, unless he shaves and gets a haircut. Okay, 
I mean, I remember seeing him in the Texas Austin uh, Paradise walking around before the hard steel was announced with our favorite Claire Williams. And boy, was he looking. You know, he really blended in with the Ron Dennis's and Toto Wolves of the F1 paddock. Okay, sir, now we come to our interview. Double the pleasure. How cool it is. Two of the drivers we interviewed go on to win the Daytona 24 hours. Felipe Nasser made a big impression when he raced at Daytona some years ago. He has been racing in American Sports Car Championship after his Formula 1 days, and I have been following his career since he got on the podium in his racing debut back in his Formula BMW days in Brazil. So very good talent. And we have been following the career of Mr. Joseph Newgarden since he was racing in GP3 Championship in Europe. He is a two-time IndyCar champion. Last year he won the last lap shootout at the Indy 500 and now he has won at Daytona on debut. All in all, a fantastic achievement by both drivers and Porsche Penske team. Victory for Roger's team is the first since Mark Donahue won for him in 1969 driving a Lola. My great thanks to Porsche Penske PR team, David Hovis, Tina Strader and Lisa Marie Thomas. The interview opportunity and late evening coffee, much appreciated. Here we go. Okay, folks, I'm here at Daytona on a cold evening with two hot drivers, Felipe Nasser and Joseph Newgarden. How many races have you watched so far in F1? When I was there, a couple, right? I mean, you mean on TV or in person? Oh, on TV? We were in person, right? You did a couple of races. Yeah, the U.S. Uh, were you at? No, you were not at U.S. Grand Prix, were you? Yeah, I was there. Remember, I met you and uh, Amir. Is Amir here, by the way? No, he's not here. This yeah. week. I've been following his career since he got on podium in Formula BMW at Interlagos. Same. Same. <laughs> yeah. And so I knew, I knew when he was in Formula BMW. And I have news for you. I don't, I'm sure you don't remember. We met when you were in GP3. Do you remember that? I, you know... I'm going to be honest with you, I don't remember that, but I believe that. Uh, GP3 is a little bit of a blur for me. It was a very short, it was a short year. I think it was seven rounds or yeah. something like that. So I'm sorry I don't remember. But <laughs> it was so good. It, it, was, it was not a good year. It was not a good year for me, I can tell you that. How is the weekend going so far, and what are the expectations for race day? Um, I think we've done a lot of good work. You know, I'm excited for these guys. It's obviously uh, the kickoff for them. Uh, both Felipe and Dane on the on the seven car to hopefully have a great 2024. You know they did such a good job in 2023 and were close to the championship. So I think that's a bit, um, that's certainly a goal for 2024. And then you know obviously just as a singular event, winning Daytona would be a big deal for everybody, including Roger. So uh, I feel pretty focused. You know, feel like we've got a great opportunity to put a great race together. I mean, I think you the way you win this race is by putting it all together, not making mistakes and you know, all of us having, you know, good stints and, and putting our all into it. So I, I feel I feel confident we can have a good race and, you know, maybe we'll have a shot at the end. What say you, amigo? What I say, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be sharing the car with this guy here next to me. And, uh, Are you sure on that? Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's, I think we've got a pretty strong lineup uh, to be fighting for the win here, and that's the aim. I didn't come all this way for not to be fighting for the win, so... We, you know, the, the plan is to keep on working for this. And uh, from all the 23 season, I feel like we, we built up a lot of things. We, we improved in many areas in the team, you know, various areas, found, finding performance, finding better operation, understanding the car better, understanding the tires better. So I expect now that we, for sure we're going to have a tough competition here in, uh, in the 24-hour race. It's a race that it requires a lot of patience. You have to make the right decisions at the right time. It's a race that is only decided at the very end. So until then, we just got to have the car in one piece. Uh, so luckily we have this time, this week and next week, a little bit more practice just to tune in the car a little more for the race and prepare ourselves for every procedure that might happen. So driver changes, procedures in the car, in the system, with the team, because we go right away on this first race of the year and it's by far the biggest race of the year for us in the IMSA championship so uh, getting everybody up to speed is super important this week so uh, making the most of the time on the track and off track to discuss ideas and strategy and preparation is super important. Where do you expect the most competition to come from? 
I have to say I've I've seen the field very close uh, this year, especially going on year two of the GTP class. I feel like everybody has done a step on everything. Every everybody is better. Every team is opera operating better. So uh, I cannot really say we have one favorite, but we got a lot of cars out there that will be competitive. So I'm looking forward to the big fight there. Okay. Uh, Joseph, you are full time in Indy cars with Captain. Racing here by choice, or is this a job requirement? Oh, this is very much by choice. Um, I've wanted to run this race for a long time, and um, it's a great honor to be here with this iconic brand, Porsche, and I think an iconic pairing. You know, when you look at Porsche and Penske, the lineage is very historic, and I've you know seen multiple versions of this combination, and, and they've they've always found great success together. So, it's a big privilege, and for me, it's a Definitely a choice to be here. I've always wanted to run this race, so to, to be able to run also with Felipe in the same car is pretty cool. You know, I feel like we've got really good good drivers and good personnel working on this program, and I really just think you know if we if we run a a good race, a, a great race, then we'll have an opportunity to compete for the win. Uh, I truly believe that, and that's why we're here. Just as Felipe said, we don't we don't show up and put all this effort in to not go for the win. So I think if we can put ourselves in position, we're, we're definitely going to try and take it. Would you be doing any more IMSA races like Sebring and some other stuff? I hope so. You know, I'm here at Daytona. Um, this is what I'm signed up for right now. Let's get through this this okay. event. Let's see how we do. And if uh, if we make a good event together, then then hopefully I can do some more with the team. Okay, Felipe, anything and everything at Penske Racing is first class. Uh, please tell us how this deal came about and what it means for your career. Oh, well, this, uh, this deal came along, I think it was in the middle of, uh, 2021 when I was still driving for uh, Action Express Racing and I was going for another championship in IMSA, another DPI championship. I remember when I saw the news that Porsche Penske they were gonna come together for this project and on that day when I saw the news I sent Roger and team an email saying my desire to be involved with Porsche and Penske to be in this organization and I raised my hand, you know, like, uh, I haven't heard a reply, like, right away, and then suddenly we came along when they were starting to look for drivers, you know. I think in 2021 was when I, you know, in the second half of the year was when I started discussions with Porsche and Penske. It uh, was always a desire of mine, a, a dream of mine to be representing uh, such a manufacturer and s such a team as well. Like uh, Joseph said, you know, two legendary names in the sport. And one thing I knew for sure is I wanted to make history with them. And that was what really gave me the drive to, to come on board the project. Uh, I knew it wasn't going to be easy to start because we had to build up everything from scratch, from zero. But I have full confidence, you know, we, we sure are going to be in a position to be successful and we're working towards it. Okay, cool. Uh, Joseph, last lap of the Indy 500 last year. How many butterflies were there in the tummy of men from Tennessee? It was stressful. It, it was very. That was a unique uh, ending to the Indy 500. You know, red flags have become more frequent at that specific event towards the end. Um, but we had three for the 2023 race, which um, you know made it stressful at the end to understand exactly what to do and, and where to be and how to position yourself. And, and that final lap, you knew it was for everything. You know, it didn't you didn't know how it was going to go, but this was. I mean, this was going to be the decider on this lap. So if caution comes out or you don't make the move at the right point, that's going to be, that's going to be it. But I, I think we, you know, similar to this race, we had put ourselves in position all day and we gave ourselves an opportunity. And when it was time to close, we closed on that very final lap. So I, it's, you know, I, I think very much about that race and how it relates to, to this one. And I think it's the exact same thing. We've got to make it all the way through. We've got to put ourselves in position. And then whoever's finishing, uh, you know, it's probably going to be this hot shoe, Felipe, then we put him in position. Uh, or if it's somebody else, and we try and capitalize on the moment. Now, the move you made uh, last lap to take the lead, extreme intensity of motor racing, almost into the pit lane, and that's in the news these days. Uh, was it just pure driving instinct or result of audio memo from Tim Sendrick? I, I I think in a lot you're talking the, 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 the moving around the moving around. Well, it, it's a style that's developed at Indy because of the way the racing has developed. Um, they call, they've called it a lot of things. You know, the the dragon, yeah. the the snake, 
I think actually Montoya was the first one to implement it in 2015. When <laughs> what he, a surprise! Yeah, he. I, so if anybody instigated this thing, it was Montoya, um, and it's just gotten more aggressive ever since. You know, I, I think there's going to be some new rules changes uh, because of the last lap uh, in 2023. I think there'll be some lines that are defined. But I knew the rules at the end, and I was going to be as aggressive as possible to try and win the race. We were in position coming off turn four, so. Yeah, for me it was uh, it was for the win. You know, you had to you had to go for it, and, and you know I was as aggressive as I knew I could be legally. How did you see that move, though? Did you see it in your mind? Like it was yeah. about time to do it. I knew I knew if I could get ahead, I was gonna I was gonna I was basically gonna go as far away from his as possible off turn four. I mean, aggressive, too yeah. aggressive, probably nearly going into pit lane, and it's le it was legal to do. Yeah, it was very important to know because that was not officiated the pit lane line, which I think now will change. But uh, it's very cool to watch though. Yeah, but yeah. when you're in position, you know it's the 500. So yeah. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm guessing he did not get a Christmas card from Marcus Ericsson last month. Uh, no, I, I think you know honestly, Mar I, I always enjoy seeing Marcus. You know, I think he's been uh, he's been tremendous. Honestly, every time I see him, you know, he understands that. It's racing, and sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it doesn't. Honestly, we've had nothing but good interactions, genuinely. So uh, I've got a lot of respect for Marcus because of that. It's tough. I mean, look, you know, if I if I was Marcus, I, I would want to be the same way he is. I would be disappointed that we didn't win the race, but I would be respectful, and he's been tremendously respectful. That's good to hear. Uh, Felipe, you have raced both at Daytona and Le Mans. Both are 24-hour races. One has the long Mistral Strait, and the other has the incredible banking. How similar are strategies for these races? Well, I would say the dynamic of the race is a little bit different uh, in Le Mans compared to, to Daytona itself. I feel like Daytona, it's a much more compressed field because you don't have such a long lap, so you're constantly overtaking cars. And I think that very good drivers, they know how to deal with that on every situation, knowing when to take the risk and knowing when to back off because this race is not won in the first 20 hours. And you will see guys who want to prove a point and then make that simple mistake which is trying to prove a point before those before goal time which is the last four hours. But it's still like you have to look after your car, you have to look after the information you give to your teammates, you know, it's a long race. Uh, I've seen a lot of things here. Sometimes you you might be a lap down. Next thing you see, you are fighting for for the win. You know, it, anything is possible. And uh, I think Le Mans could be more of a penalty if you have you know any kind of damage in the car or if you have a puncture. Since it's a much longer track, to recover to the pits and make yourself ready again is much tougher. So, but again, the way you face the race, I think they are very similar in a way. It's just the dynamic how they go is is a little bit different. Going over 200 miles per hour at Mulsanne and Daytona banking, more fun at high noon or after midnight? Oh, I would say when it comes to nighttime, I feel like the just the impression of speed gets much much higher. You know, the visibility, the the lights, the cars, the brakes, everything just glows, and it's it just makes this race magical. You know, it's it's. It's phenomenal to be part of it, especially if you are driving at that night stint, you know, from whenever it turns to dark to early in the morning. It's like one of the best experiences you can have in, 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 in motor racing, I would say. Uh, Joseph, I always ask any car drivers what would they like to win more, the 500 or the championship? You have achieved both. <laughs> Question is, what do you treasure more, the Bog Warner Trophy or the Astor Cup? And please, no PC answer. Well, my answer is always you have, you choose both. You know, I, I don't know how you can. You know, I've always, I've, every year I've heard this question. And um, I think now having won the 500, it, it, it is, you know, certainly it's it's a bit more cherished at the moment for me because it, it took me 12 years to win it. It's a very difficult race to get right. You know, I think like in endurance racing, uh, it's like winning Le Mans over, you know, the championship. You probably choose uh, in a lot of respects to, to win Le Mans outright. But the real answer is you choose both. You know, you try. You want to win the championship in Le Mans, and and in IndyCar, it's you want to win the championship in the 500. Okay, so now, a PC, very very mildly PC. <laughs> okay, that's fine. We'll take it. Okay, um, in IndyCar racing, um, you have uh, two teammates at Penske Racing. Is there a lot of data sharing between the drivers, or each one doing their thing? And among the three drivers, 
What do you think is your biggest strength? Uh, there's a tremendous amount of sharing. You know, I know Team Penske quite well. Uh, this is going to be my eighth season with them on the IndyCar side. I think it's you know similar to the environment I see here. Obviously, this is a different program. You know, it's it's uh, aligned with Porsche, so there's a lot of support. But I think the synergy amongst the team is pretty tremendous. It, in IndyCar, it's a it's a very open book. You know, we are all trying to beat each other, but at the same time, we're trying to lift the whole organization up. And uh, you know, that competitive spirit, but that support is what you know drives drives everything forward. It's it's one of the things I noticed most about Felipe actually when I when I first joined. I mean, not to, to not to just single him out, but I think he's he's like a, he's a tremendous teammate, and we we have that on the IndyCar side. We we have really good support for each other, and I noticed that right away from him on on this side. And it makes you better, you know. I think the more open you are, of course, we want to beat each other, but when you support each other, you, you lift the whole organization up. You know, I, I think that would be the quality that I try to have too. Is is I'm pretty ruthless with my driving, but um, I want to do it in the right way, in a fair way, and you know, be a good teammate. Uh, Felipe, in racing, highs are very high and lows are very low. And as we found out, bizarre are very bizarre. 2015 Australian Grand Prix, uh, you were with Sauber. They had uh, two cars and three drivers. And Guido van der Garde walking around in Ericsson suit was hilarious. Uh, can you share uh, with us what was going on in the team and in your mind when this uh, courtroom drama was being played out in the paddock? It was like a, it was like a movie, right? You just said it all. Three drivers trying to drive one car. It wasn't going to work out, right? But anyway, that's how it started, you know? The F1 journey. Remember, I remember that I missed FP1 in a track that you have no chance to drive because it's closed all year long. And uh, FP2 was when I did my first laps in the Melbourne track. The next thing I knew, I was crossing that finish line fifth place. So uh, it was my best ever result in Formula 1. The best debut for a Brazilian in Formula One, and um, yeah, great memories of Australia. That's all I can say. He started pretty chaotic, but he ended out ended out pretty good. Yeah, you got a lot of press for being the highest placed Brazilian on debut. That was great. Okay, senor, a question for you. <laughs> Parents make a lot of sacrifices for kids. In your case, your dad also put you in touch with the Disney princess who is now your wife. Uh, give us a little detail on this fairy tale, please. I mean, it's true. I guess my, my dad ended up being my wingman. You know, if, if he didn't leave my contact information for uh, Ariel at the time, then I wouldn't have met my wife. So, yeah, their parents are tremendously helpful. <laughs> my dad has been, he's been, uh, he's been very good to me in my life for many reasons. Okay, thank you so much. Gentlemen, thanks for joining F1Weekly.com. Back to you, Nass. And, sir, this is the late breaking news uh, today. Christian Horner under investigation by an independent counsel for inappropriate behavior. Not sure what happened. Maybe he got too spicy with one of the office girls. And, like you said, Mr. Rogers, innocent till proven guilty. But there is something I read, which uh, I made a note here I would like to read here. Uh, this news was f first spoken by a newspaper called D Telegraph from Netherlands. And then apparently something happened, whatever the allegations are, they are stemming from the ski event that Red Bull holds in Kitzbühel. You probably heard of this place. Other team principals were also there, Zach Brown and Toto Wolf. Okay, this is from uh, one of the German magazines. I've been, you know, click of a button in this day, you can get things translated. And this is from motorsport-total.com. It says here, details about this are known to our editors, but will not be published in the interest of the privacy of all parties involved. In the meantime, Red Bull in Fuschel am See, which is where they are based out of in Austria, is said to have a dossier, listen to this, with incriminating material that summarizes the accusations, and they are now being investigated internally by Red Bull. Now, what I have read, and again, gentlemen, is innocent till proven guilty. He may have done a something like a Brett Farr kind of text messaging, and that's what the allegations are. So it's very, very sad, especially if it comes out to be true. I hope it's not, uh, because, you know, I have a lot of respect for Christian Honor as a chief, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Would you have any comment on this, sir? Once again, innocent till proven guilty. I think it's it's being mentioned a little too much in the press, but that's the way it is today. I feel bad for the Horner family 
and I'm hoping everything is cleared up. Thank you for listening, and please enjoy. Bye-bye. Good night. Hi, I'm Philippe Inassi, and you listen to F1 Weekly.